Nationalist and far-right parties have more seats than ever after the European elections. Are they now a major force in the EU Parliament? Welcome to Roundtable. Good to have you along and a warm welcome from me, David Foster. The centre ground has been trampled and the invaders are the dissatisfied and the disaffected from what were once called the fringes. But do they have enough in common to become a united and powerful force? The European elections is the second largest democratic contest in the world, second only to the Indian elections. Going into this election, there were predictions of a major surge for the far right. And while those parties did end up with more seats than ever, the overall picture is complicated. There were gains for the far right in some countries, but losses in others. In France, Marine Le Pen's National Front won the biggest share. In Hungary, Viktor Orban's Fidesz party took more than half the votes, and Italy's league was the biggest party. Its leader, Deputy PM Matteo Salvini, has been trying to create a coalition of far-right parties across Europe to rival the traditional centrist blocs in the EU Parliament. But whether he can bring them together and keep them there remains to be seen. In Spain, Denmark and Germany, far-right parties fared worse than in other recent elections. And while the traditional big parties lost the most votes, Greens and smaller pro-EU parties did see gains. It's a fragmented picture, but the right showed they are a force. So where does this leave the EU? And I'm very pleased to say that joining me at the round table, we have Richard Whitburn, Professor of Politics and International Relations at the University of Kent. Helen Drake is here, Professor of French and European Studies at the University of Loughborough, London. Roger Bootle, too, Chairman of Capital Economics and David Blunt, Lecturer in International Relations at City University, London. Uh, thank you for coming. You, you've all had a little bit of time now to, to look at the results. So, Helen, let me ask you first of all, and, and each one of you can answer this as well. What do you think has changed? One thing that's changed is perhaps the, not the most obvious, which is we're all paying attention to the European Parliament elections. And that's quite a, that's quite a phenomenon. That, that's, quite, that's quite unusual. So that's something that I think um, tells us about the, the, the context that these elections have happened in. Um, perhaps more, more prosaically, there's been a shift in the, the sort of the usual lineup in the European Parliament. So the centre ground in the European Parliament. Centre left and centre right. Yeah, the centre ground in the European Parliament uh, typically has been formed of the left and the right, and now we see that that majority has been has been overturned, if you like, has been eaten away by parties more sort of to the to the periphery. So that that's changed too. Perhaps nothing's changed as well. If we think about the the UK context and the the issue that we have ahead of us, which is Brexit, so-called delivering Brexit, um, it's possible that this outcome of the European elections, despite the results of the so-called Bre of the Brexit party. Uh, won't necessarily change, change things in the sense of moving things along that much. Do you think as an idea this has weakened the European Union? I mean, I would say that actually what it's done is it's make the European Parliament look more representative in terms of where, you know, the sort of currents of, of European politics are at the moment. The fact that, you know, in a lot of European countries you've got a, a significant number of parties contesting across the political spectrum. You've now got in the European Parliament a shift from what you had in the past, as Helen said, which is essentially it was a sort of centre-right, centre-left cabal which made the Parliament work. Now we're going to have something which is much more, I think, about sort of trading between uh, different groups uh, and particularly the, uh, the sort of centre ground, the centrist parties are going to have more of a role than they've had in the past. So I, I think the Parliament, in a strange way, looks much more like uh, domestic politics. But, but domestic uh, a, a lot of those who, who've arrived on the scene in these elections are disaffected. Um, and therefore they are going to want to take a look at the European Union as, as a project, perhaps. Well, I think we need to be careful when we talk about disaffection. If we look at the four biggest blocks in the European Parliament now, uh, we have the centre-right, the centre-left, but then we also have the Greens, who have stormed up in this mm. election, who are very pro-European. And then we have the centrist Liberals, the ALDE, who are also pro-European. So if we take that voting bloc together, we have roughly 500 I'm of 700 I'm talking about seats. a concept, not necessarily the power to change the laws. I'm talking about a concept. This 
election has shown that there are a great many more people who are unhappy with the way the European Union is, is working. Wouldn't that be fair, Roger? I think it is fair. Um, I wouldn't want to overdo the significance, frankly, of the results for anything, really. Uh, it's right to say that we are unusually focused and interested in these yeah. results compared to previous years, but you know they don't actually matter that much. But I think you're right in a sense, to the extent they matter, they do show a lot of disillusion, disaffection with the European Union, and not everyone feels that, of course, but at the margin, there are candidates who've done extremely well, who are very much of that view. In Britain, of course, the Brexit Party. In Italy, Salvini and his followers. That strong showing points that way. But then, of course, it's a complicated picture, this. You've got to look at it country by country, because the results in France weren't really a massive upset, mm. were they? If of anything, I think Marine Le Pen did marginally less well than she was supposed to do. And the results in Germany, although the in support for the SPD and the rise of the Greens. Rise That's of the Greens, yeah. But other than that, it's not really a great shock. But I would say it's really Italy and Britain that look, I think, the most interesting. We'll come to individual countries, if we may, in, in just a moment. Um, David, I did cut you off a little <laughs> bit there, just to bring Roger in, because I, I knew that the point he wanted to make was that there, it's a changing. Yes. It's a changing phase. Yeah, I mean, I think that we're not seeing disaffection with the European Union as a whole, but we're seeing a bit of a disaffection with how politics have been done in the European Union over the past 10 or so years. So a shift away from the traditional blocs, but still a pro-European sentiment, just looking for a change of leadership, perhaps. Can I just, yeah, I just add, I mean, the EP, the European Parliament elections, typically are so-called second order elections. So um, research suggests that when people turn out to vote, and, and don't forget that we still vote effectively on a domestic basis, um, that when people turn out to vote, it's not uncommon for uh, a for there to be high abstention, and in fact, that is something else that's changed. The abstention rate across the board, including here in the UK, irony of ironies, has has dropped somewhat. In other words, slightly more people have turned out to vote. Um, but but typically, in in a so-called second order election, where people perhaps don't actually think of it as that important, it can be used to give the incumbent uh, government a bit of a a uh, bit of a kicking, to use that expression. Uh, so in the case of France, for example, you, you mentioned France, looking at the results there, um, it's, I think it was only President Sarkozy, uh, of all people, who, who bucked that trend uh, and, uh, and previously sort of um, was able to maintain his popularity. Yeah. But, but, but in all the other European Parliament elections in France, um, including, you could say, this one, to an extent, it's it's not unusual for voters to to see it as like a free pass almost to express themselves, and you, you talked about uh, the disaffected uh, without feeling that it has any impact on anything. Mm. And, is... and when it came to, to France, yes. Marine Le Pen pretty much level pegging with yeah. Macron, yeah. but doing pretty well for an extreme party. Does that, if we would translate that to domestic politics, mean that nationalism in France and by extension perhaps across other European countries? is inexorably on the rise. Well, I think, I mean, if you look at these elections, I think one of the things it shows is that there are very different visions of Europe which are now represented in the European Parliament and are represented in domestic politics. I mean, the old, the old sort of cabal in effect, which took the view that there was a, you know, the answer to every problem was more Europe. Uh, that's now not the answer that some of these parties are actually offering in the national context, but also I presume they'll want to offer in the European Parliament context. So that will change, I think, the dynamic within the Parliament where the Parliament has power. But I think that's reflective of the fact that there is now a much more sort of contested notion of what Europe is or should be. Uh, and therefore, you know, the ability to sort of set the agenda in the way that was set in the past. And indeed, you know, Mr. Macron's idea that in a way we need to sort of jumpstart Europe, mm. that looks a bit problematic, doesn't it, for him in terms of yeah. selling that idea in? Yeah, but I think what's interesting on this is that compared to, say, 2014, you're not seeing people talking about leaving the European Union, even in these far-right nationalist parties. There's no talk of Frexit or, Grex or you know, German Brexit. You know, these things are not on the discussion table anymore. They're talking about reform. They're talking about change. But breaking apart Europe perhaps because of the experience of Brexit, is no longer because a rallying Because it looks like call. a very painful operation, even if perhaps they would think it might help their health. If Absolutely, like. it's yes. It's damaging. Yeah. yeah. That's, what, that's what Brexit has suggested. What about supporters of ever closer union? Mm -hmm. Have they taken a knock in this, Roger? What do you think? Well, I think, by extension from what we've been saying earlier, yes, to some extent, that's true. Uh, but it's not really going to determine anything, I think. I mean, it's going to be the fundamental economics, 
plus the politics between France and Germany that are going to decide this, I think. I don't think, really, these marginal changes in composition of the European Parliament will make a great deal of difference. The fact that so many people in so many countries, you're right, have expressed some sort of disquiet, anyway, with the existing setup doesn't help, but I don't think, in and of itself, it stops the issue of ever closer union. I think, frankly, uh, there are other things that are much more important than that. OK, let's go through a couple of countries, um, starting with Italy first. You mentioned Salvini. Yeah. How are they going to bring all of these disparate groups, La Liga, Five Star, um, Marine Le Pen's group, the, the other ones in, in, in Hungary, etc.? How are they going to bring them all together? I think it's incredibly difficult, because by their very nature, I mean, they are sort of national, national political projects. But I think but there are issues at stake at the European level, which are, uh, first of all, uh, using it as an opportunity to to play a bit on a, on a bigger stage, you know, to, to be disruptive. And we see that uh, certainly with the sort of current, current Hungarian government where there is this, it probably for me, it was one of the campaigns where there was the most sort of conscious attempt uh, to, to say what we do in Hungary actually has implications for what we do with Europe, alongside the French example, but obviously coming at this from, from quite different uh, perspectives. But I think that one of the first issues we're going to get into, of course, is the election of the, the Commission President. And that's going to tell us something both about what the dynamic is between the member states, how they interpret these results, and absolutely crucially... OK, so what Germany should we be looking for there when it comes to electing a replacement for, for Juncker? So the, the texts, the treaties that are in force, are a little bit ambiguous. A little, there's a little bit of leeway in, in, in the sense that the person who emerges as the, as you said, the replacement for Jean-Claude Juncker as the European Commission president is supposed to reflect the, um, the will of, the, of the, the European Parliament, if you like, the, reflect the makeup of the Parliament. And as we've already said earlier, and Richard used the word cabal, that what that has meant in practice is that the, um, for some time now, the presidency of the Commission has shifted between the candidate from the centre-left and the candidate from the centre-right. Um, and that sort of has, things have been on track for that to take place up until now, but that's looking as if it may well be disrupted, and in particular, President uh, Macron, um, some would say cynically, because he wants to get his French candidate in, Barnier, you know, that, 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 but I think makes an interesting point that perhaps business is not as usual, and that we should not automatically expect that the next president of the commission will be the leader of the big, the, the, the group with the biggest number of seats in, in, the, in the European Parliament. So very interesting to see what happens here. In a very short period of time, I might add, with, over the next Does four or five Does Parliament weeks. actually, uh, we're talking about it because it's reflective of people's feelings at the moment, but does it really have any power? I mean, to Helen's point, I mean, I think it's one of these moments where there is a connection between the way in which people have expressed a view and arguments that could be made to support the candidacy of an individual. Uh, and, and whether uh, uh, someone like Mr. Mr Macron seeks to sort of circumvent the Spitzenkandidaten process, whether, uh, uh, whether, uh, whether the Chancellor in Germany sort of seeks to, to preserve that idea. So I think in, in that sense, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the Parliament results matter, and certainly for parliamentarians themselves, and certainly for the sort of centrists. I mean, they are now very, very keen on playing the role of king or queen uh, maker because they see this as a moment for them in their politics and the policy of the parliament to, to make an impact. Surely the answer is it doesn't have any real <laughs> power. Uh, contrast it with the British Parliament, for instance. I mean, this is a parliament which three times has voted down the Prime Minister's withdrawal agreement and in the process uh, consigned her to political oblivion. What is the European equivalent of that? This British Parliament uh, may well, we learn from prospective uh, possible leaders of the Conservative Party, uh, we may well find that it rejects whatever the next Conservative leader brings forward and triggers a general election, which may well see the obliteration of the Conservative Party. That's a parliament with power. I mean... Well, can I just ask you a question? A talking let me, let me, shot. Let's, let's get on to Britain in, in this one now. Okay. Uh, when it comes to the European elections, we, we've seen the Brexit Party do particularly well. New British political party obviously devoted to leaving the European Union. A name speaks for itself. But let's say this now triggers uh, Britain leaving without a deal. Mm. What will that mean for the rest of Europe? Roger, can you carry on for a moment with that one? Well, I'm not sure in the short term it will have a huge impact. I mean, there are some senior 
European politicians, including reputedly President Macron, who are quite relaxed about that. They might even want it. I think economically it won't be helpful to the European Union. And I'm sure that if we do leave without a deal, there will be people on both sides who will want to forge a deal after we've left. And that's perfectly reasonable, it seems to me, to forge some sort of free trade agreement. I don't really think that is the big issue. The big issue, I think, is going to be how Britain does. I mean, if Britain leaves without a deal, um, whatever uh, deal is struck subsequently, Britain does pretty well, then this notion that um, Europe's going to hang together and support uh, ever closer unions, so that's for the birds, frankly. But, but that's going to take some time. It's going to take a while. To be determined, isn't well, it? Well, we're going to know, I think, within a year whether there's any sort of disaster, probably within six months, because the really bad effects will be concentrated in the early period, the disruption. Within a year, we'll have a pretty good idea. Does anybody else want to kick in on Britain and the UK and Brexit on this one? Because I'm quite happy to move on, right. if you like, to other countries and other things, because we're talking about the bigger picture. Do you think well, what, what's happened could... in Britain could be important? I could just say a couple of things. Um, I mean, one is that the presence of um, over 20... MEPs from the Brexit party in the European Parliament, assuming they take up their seats, which is a big assumption because the UK may well have left by then. You know, that, that, that is a, a rather strange situation and it doesn't do Britain's credibility any good. So in some ways, having um, a big delegation of British MEPs who are there because they want to leave but, but does, is, sorry, is going uh, to make the other member states less likely to want the UK to stay. Yeah, but, but does it so, make yes, any it, difference to the rest of Europe? In, yeah. in terms of the way the rest of Europe goes, other than sort of saying to Great Britain, oh, well, sorry, you're too much of a nuisance. Yes, to go it does, away. yeah. I mean, whether whatever happens with Brexit, let's assume <coughs> that Brexit happens, whether it happens with a deal or without a deal, um, and the way that it transpires, the way that it unfolds over the short and the long term, of course it will have an effect on the rest of the Europe. I mean, Richard talks, you know, is a specialist on, on, on foreign policy and security, and these are areas where, where there will be an effect. But it's not just the direct effects, the policy effects. It's, it's how the UK then cooperates and how we work with our allies and the nature of those relationships. Those bonds are very strong at the moment. Um, and, and right now, especially sending a Brexit delegation to the European Parliament, it undermines the United Kingdom's sort of credibility. It, I agree yeah. with that, but I think that it's easy to overstress it, right? Because we have to remember that prior to this election, there were 25 or 24 UKIP MEPs making very similar noises to what the Brexit Party has been doing. So whether this is going to be a sea change for Britain's representation in the Parliament, I'm, I yeah. think it's been overstressed. To okay, be so, so I'm, I'm getting the feeling that you think it, it may be damaging to Britain, but uh, the rest of, to the rest of Europe, it's just something that has to be lived with. Can I, can I put that to one side at the moment and talk about the Sure, creators? I mean, maybe just one thing yep. to say about the Parliament. Perhaps we might be looking in the wrong place where British European parliamentarians might have an effect, because, of course, what they've done with this success, the Liberal Democrats, is have actually boosted that centrist group much more than was actually expected. So that plays with this idea that the centre holds. Can, can I make a suggestion here? That the immigration used to be the big issue. It's about where it was in terms of polls uh, 10 years ago. It, it's still the most important issue in voters' minds uh, when it comes to European Union. But I think the one that's galloping up on the outside um, is the environment and what's called the Greta Thunberg Mm. effect. This young schoolgirl who's encouraged her um, well, peers around the, the world to actually take action and press politicians for action on climate change. Now, the Greens have been, I think, possibly the biggest winners overall in this. Well, what's the feeling about that? Well, if you just take Germany as an example, I mean, it appears to have been the issue that, that drove German voters to the polls. I mean, issues like migration were, were further down the list. Whether that's uh, an outlier or whether that's indication as to you know where sort of public sentiment is going to go, we obviously we obviously have to wait and see. But it will have an impact uh, within the, the the politics of the European Union because generally, yes. you know, Germany uh, obviously uh, has a, has a sort of leading importance. And if that's a sea change in sort of public sentiment in Germany, which has already been there, but it's now clearly coming to much more ahead. But uh, is that going to leave Germany as an outlier? I mean, are there other states in, in, in Central Eastern Europe, for example, I mean, are they going to care as much about that sort of agenda? Are they going to see that that's potentially da uh, damaging or harming for their economic prospects and so on? That looks to me as if that's going to be one of the fault lines now. Do you, do you, do you think, uh, anybody else, but Roger, I'm asking this of you, do you, do you think the Greens' agenda is now going to be um, pushed to the, the forefront? And, and economically, it's expensive, isn't it, for countries 
economies to, to push yeah. uh, to have that as part of their It can be very expensive, um, but uh, the, the surge of the Greens, the Greens did well in the UK too, mm -hmm. um, is reflecting real anxiety and strong feelings on the part of a large part of the electorate. I think actually you can see here the breakdown of the traditional divisions, not just in Britain but in other countries too, which were all about things like public ownership, your attitude to markets and these things. We were left with these, I think, rather ossified political structures reflecting disputes and realities that had long since passed, really, whereas all sorts of big issues that were relevant to society now didn't form, find reflection in the party system. They're now starting to. So across Europe, we're getting these strong showings from parties that want some sort of nationalist agenda and want to decentralise or maybe even break up the EU or leave it like the Brexit party. And the, the rise of the Green Party is, I think, in many ways, extremely encouraging. It's, it's showing some revitalisation of politics because people really do care about these things, whether they've originated from the left or the right. So why did you say in something you've, you've written or to, to one of our producers that you think that this is um, a big threat to the euro, what we've seen here, mm. and, and by extension to the European Union... It itself. If you think this is encouraging, why is it damaging? Well, I said that particular development is, I think, encouraging. I'm all for debate and for politics being real and reflecting what people really think. But if you look at the results compared to the norm, uh, then what these results show is a rise of support for nationalist parties and people who question the direction in which the EU has been travelling in. And, and, and by extension of, of that, it means that people think politicians aren't listening, and now they have to listen, whether it be about nationalist sentiments or whether it be about environmental concerns, etc., etc. That's going to be a big change, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. I mean, I think the underlayer of this is that the youth vote was very important for the Green Party. Young people are coming out, they're not voting for the major political parties. You know, the SPD in Germany has seen its vote shrink dramatically because it's not replacing its voters. And this is a story that might be told about the Labour Party, the Socialist Party in France. Uh, the traditional parties are not able to appeal to the younger generation, especially on issues like the climate crisis, which is why we're seeing this big swing towards Green parties. If I could just add a couple of things. Of course on, you can, that's why you're here. <laughs> on, the matter of the, on the matter of the Greens, just to sort of go back to brass tacks in a way. So the elections to the European Parliament are by uh, proportional representation, meaning that it's, it's easier, in, 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 relatively speaking, for, part, for, for parties to get representation that they won't get at the national level. So in the case of the Greens, um, to do well at the EP level, the level of the European Parliament, can be a, a route to influence through the European Parliament. And the European Parliament does have a, a history of sort of uh, voting on, should we call them value-based issues? They like to, be seen, like to be seen as a progressive force traditionally. But at the same time, so the Greens in France, who did rather well with around 13% of the votes, this gives them visibility uh, in the national, in, in the, on, the domestic, on the domestic scene. It also gives them some funding. Mm. I mean, one of the problems that Marine Le Pen's party has got vis-a-vis -vis the European Parliament at the moment is that is the sort of investigations into um, the misuse of European parliamentary funding. So um, PR might it, it gives them representation but it gives them visibility and it gives them funding and, and crucially media attention. So again the effects may be indirect um, as well as direct okay. to, to, for the Greens to have done okay so at they, the EP they, level. Done okay. Um, the voters have said you politicians aren't listening. What, what do you think of Roger's suggestion that because of that, um, the project as a whole and closer integration are a thing of the past? I think, I mean, it's already been something which has been under stress uh, anyway, and, and, and increasingly so since the Maastricht Treaty uh, and Economic and Monetary Union and the rise, rise of the euro. I think now we're getting a, a different kind of electoral catch up. So what people are doing is they're looking at that as a sort of structure and as a process uh, and and seeing that something that you can test uh, or can contest as much as something that you can support. And I think the tune in the past was pretty much that, you know, there was a, there were a group of politicians that straddled left and right who were broadly supportive of the project, saw it going in a particular direction. direction. We, you know, we're now on real bread and butter issues, particularly on the economy, the governance of the economy, macroeconomic policy, monetary policy, which has direct effects back on individual member states. And therefore, the stakes are higher for people when they see the direction that European integration is actually going in. So I think it has created an interest, but not necessarily 
the direct lever for sort of public to say, actually, I don't like that policy. I'd much rather have another policy. And some of the key areas for European integration, like economic and monetary union, uh, governing the Eurozone are not something that the Parliament has much of a role in, but they're things that the public is very interested in for obvious reasons. OK, I've got, I've got to wrap it up here. So just a quick final word from, from you, David. Roger thinks the project's threatened existentially. If we're sitting here in uh, the next European parliamentary... It, it, next European parliamentary elections, what will we be saying about the, the single currency and the project itself? Well, I mean, the single currency is always going to be a bit up in the air just because the institutions at the European level are not the same as an institution for a national currency. So I think we'll still always be talking about the euro so long as it exists. But I don't think we're going to see the European Union fall apart in the next five years because it is a major source of economic security, right? The, creating a free market in Europe is incredibly prosperous for all members involved. There might be an uneven distribution, there might be disaffection, but is it enough to really undermine the European project? I, I'd be surprised. Listen, thank you all very much indeed. We have to leave it there. We have several more years at least until we have to talk about all this once again. I wonder what the European Union will look like by then. Indeed, what will the world look like by then? For me, David Foster, from the entire team, thank you for watching. See you next time. Bye-bye.